Absolutely. Cool. So I'm waiting on Trust and Terry, but I might just I might just get rolling and I think he'll pop in. Um, because I just want to respect everybody's time. And right now we're looking and it is right. Oh, so I just shared out that link. So if anybody's in the audience, if you would be so kind as to uh, share that link. Um, you can share the link from the space. You can share the one that's on my page. Either one would be really, really great. And that will be able to get this out there. I know it's Friday in the middle of the day, but people can tune in from work and all of that. And we will get rolling. This is going to kind of be a wrap up. You know, I used to do these at 5 p.m. on Fridays, but that time slot's gotten really crowded. And I think that this time slot might work a little bit better um, for some people to be able to just talk and chat. So we're going to have a little bit of live action with the market today. So people will be able to chat if there's any trades that they're making for the end of the week. Uh, but overall, if you're unfamiliar with Weekly Howl, my name is Gav Blacksburg, and I'm the COO and the voice of Wolf Financial, and I'm the host. We have a select panel of investors here, although I might bring some up from the crowd too as well if we have some time towards the end, just to chat about what they've been buying and selling this week, what's on their uh, market eyes for next week with their eye in, just going to chat around. So I'm going, oh, there we go. And Terry is here. Perfect timing. What's up, Terry? Hey, what's good? Living the dream. Having a good Friday? <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> Perfect. Were you able to figure out how to get that onto a swipe up story? Yeah, I actually just threw it up, I think. That's why I joined a little bit late. Yeah, no worries. No worries. Awesome. Well, perfect timing. Um, we're actually just getting ready to get rolling. So I am going to have uh, Stock Market News kick things off today. Um, since we have you know, four speakers for now, feel free to take you know, several minutes if you'd like and just walk through how your week's been in the market, any buys or sells that you've done, um, what you're eyeing for next week. And if there's any just overall market trends that you've been looking at, feel free to bring those up too. But floor is yours, Evan. Yeah, man, I appreciate you, Wolf. Gav, always for putting this on. I love this. So I'm just here to quickly talk about what I've been doing. So take a step back. I am a long-term investor. I'm here for, you know, years. I'm a big believer in dollar cost averaging. So you know, a lot of the times I'll make a move, but do it slowly over a couple weeks. And, you know, this week was really kind of into that. Um, you know, a as this market has gotten a little bit crazy, I've, you know, segmented my portfolio a little bit and started doing a little bit of more short term trade. So there's one or two names of that in here. But it's important to realize that the, the vast majority of my portfolio is long term holds. That's what I'm here for. So I'm going to go over and quickly look what I did this week. Oh, God, <laughs> no, the app I use is, is out. Let me switch over to my Robinhood quickly. But I can tell you guys that I started the week buying a call because my Apple call expired last week at a loss. So pretty much I'm kind of in this market. I want to always have at least one call or one thing going and kind of, you know, it's always a small part of my portfolio and it kind of allows me to have a little bit of fun. So this week I chose Palantir. I bought a... July 16th expiring call with a strike price of $25 at a premium of $1.23. So that's up nicely right now. I'm up about 67% on that, but I was holding for the 2X. Uh, I, I'm kind of am a big believer in, you know, the three-day rule, more or less that, you know, market moves move in three-day increments. And we've kind of had three green days. So I was possibly looking of moving out of this Palantir call today if the stock was up but it's not really up too much so we'll see it's looking like right now i'll probably end up holding that into next week at least but wouldn't be surprised if i if i uh if i move out of it now i'm gonna just head over to the history quickly look what i was doing of course i had the app working perfectly before and then the second i'm up here to talk it goes goes a little haywire but so pretty much i bought bitcoin uh on the 22nd so what's that tuesday yeah, Tuesday uh, on the dip. Uh, my trigger was when it went under 30K, so my buy was in at, at about 29.8. Uh, again, important to realize it's just part of a more long-term buying strategy, so just buying a dip as it comes in. The majority of my Bitcoin I hold from like 8 to 12 to 15K, so just adding a little bit higher, towering up. I added a little bit to my Skyworks position as well. Uh, Skyworks Solution is a semiconductor company that I am very bullish on personally, but you, know, you guys could do your own research into that one. It's a little bit less known than a lot of the, the bigger ones. So you may not have heard of it. The ticker is SWKS. Uh, it's just, you know, one that you guys maybe want to do a little more DD into. And then another fund I was buying was QYLD. So QYLD is a fund that buys covered, it buys NASDAQ 100 stocks and then sells covered calls against that and pays out a 
a monthly premium, um, monthly dividend. So that's one stock that I kind of have been trying to grow my position and use a little bit as a piggy bank. Um, and then some things I sold this week, I sold a little bit of Dropbox and National Beverage. So Dropbox, ticker DBX, and National Beverage, ticker FIZZ. Those are both names I still kind of like, but really just had to take a small profit um, or, you know, take a decent profit after some big moves. And, you know, I feel like market conditions are, are changing a little bit and I want to change my portfolio a little bit. So this is kind of a part of that bigger move. Uh, one last thing that I bought this week that actually is not in this account, but on Coinbase, I believe it was, is I bought a little bit. Of, uh, I want to say I bought that maybe Monday because I, I know Tuesday I was down a little bit on it, but I, I put in a small position. This was my first buy into it. Um, you know, kind of a lot of times when I buy stocks or, or buy a crypto, I'll, I'll start with an initial move after I've heard some good traction and did some basic due diligence into it and kind of, I allow myself to either build up that position going forward as I do more research or kind of, you know, uh, reevaluate a little bit after that. But so I'm pretty much in that early stage with Solana where I've been told by a couple people that this is a couple people I trust and, you know, that I would take advice in that this is something I should look into. So I, I did my basic due diligence. Uh, I kind of I kind of like the spec name in it. So I threw a little bit of a gamble at it and I'm looking to do a little more research into that in the future. So that's a name that's on my radar that I uh, will keep you guys updated on to the future, but I think that's a good coverage of what I've done or what I did. Sorry. That was a really nice rundown. Appreciate that. Um, I, I can relate to also trying to hold like a call or two in this market, um, especially over the last couple of weeks. Some of them have proven to be really fruitful. And then, you know, it's good to hear from you that you were purchasing some crypto. I think it's really when everybody's getting terrified and when like the swing comes to, you know, oh, this weekend crypto is going to get crushed and everything. It's really when the confidence is at the all time low is when that buying opportunity is there um, often because a lot of people have really um, sold at that point and they've seen too much selling. So they're ready for that bounce back. But appreciate that uh, kick off there, Evan. Thank you. Uh, all right. I'm going to keep it moving. A brand new guest to... Uh, I think my Twitter spaces, I don't know if I've had him on before, uh, and that is going to be Trust Fund Terry. Terry, as you had just heard from a Stock Market News, this is essentially, you know, an open floor to kind of talk about what you've been buying, selling, eyeing. Um, if anybody has not checked out Terry before, I highly recommend it. Always good for some info and some humor and really, really big on Instagram as well. So you can check that out, I think, probably through his bio um, or somewhere around there. So, Terry, appreciate you coming on. would love to hear from you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I think it is my first time on your Twitter space, but it's a pretty interesting space to be on. So I'm glad to be here. Um, yeah, this week I was eyeing a handful of stocks. Um, I'm pretty bullish right now on a lot of the Chinese tech stocks that took a beating about two or three months ago now. Um, they look like they're really posed for like a really strong rebound, I guess, to name some um, uh, like Baidu. Um, JD, which um, Kathy Woods was also buying up a bunch of JD this week. I noticed um, Pindudo and then Billy Billy um, are all ones that I'm invested in already and have been dollar cost averaging. Um, so I think that those are all, uh, they're right around the price where I would feel comfortable continuing to buy into those. Um, as far as other orders that I was buying this week. I bought some Ethereum uh, yesterday and it's of course down this morning. Uh, very big, but uh, I guess that's just another buying opportunity to some people. So think of it in a positive way, I guess. Um, and then outside of that, uh, Applied Materials, uh, Semiconductor Company, um, which I have also been dollar cost averaging into. A uh, very strong one that I feel uh, bullish on, as well as going back to the Chinese stock, uh, Alibaba. Um, they have been battered and beaten up uh, throughout the past almost a year, I would say, uh, because of all the Chinese regulation that's been going on. But I think that they, along with the others, will come back um, in the coming months in the fall, especially. So uh, those are some of the ones that I've been following. Uh, one last one that I'll throw out there, I guess two, 
uh, American stocks. Oh my God. You can probably get a ton of background noise. I'm outside right now. Um, Sprout Social is a marketing app. Oh my God. It's literally the trash man. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not terrible. Right, let's he, be honest. He'll leave, he'll leave. I guess I could go inside. Um, yeah, he's he's leaving. All right. Yeah, Sprout Social is one that's a marketing one. It's um, think of it as a way to like plan your posts and like. So I've seen it from a creator side. Um, people are starting to use it more often to uh, basically plan their social media like calendar if you will you can plan posts like week in, weeks in advance um it's easy to like partner up with like uh your sponsors and stuff like that and align for posts All right, I'm going inside. This is too long. and my last one that i'll just say is i love roku um that's stock i've been in for a while um i don't know if anyone follows me on iris here but my first ever post on iris which is where i um, you can follow all my trades completely transparently through my Robinhood account. Um, my first ever post is about Roku. Um, I really do believe they are, they already have pretty much, in my opinion, what's going to be a monopoly in the TV streaming device market. And I think they're just going to continue to use that leverage to take advantage of these newer entrants, basically these cable companies that are trying to build out their um like new streaming platforms. Think of like the Discovery Channels, um, the a es the TNTs, all these companies that are pretty much going to have to like um, adapt to the new marketplace of TV streaming. I think Roku is just going to absolutely have their way with most of them. They're going to have no negotiating power and they're going to get a ton of free content for what's called their new Roku channel, which has been live for about six months now. So you can check that out on the Roku app if you don't believe me. <laughs> so um, those are some of the ones that I've been trading. I didn't sell a lot this week. I still feel like we're still going to see a little bit of a, a bounce off of the bottoms that we saw in the tech, which is mostly what I'm invested last week and the week before. So um, I'm kind of a buy and hold investor for the most part, but I do do some options trading and that's where I do most of my selling from, I'll say. So can you elaborate on the option trading? Yeah, sure thing. Um, so usually I like the swing trade. So I didn't buy a lot of options or sell any this week. Most of mine actually expired last week. Um, so usually what I do is I, I look for kind of like um, moving averages right around like um, two or three months of moving averages. And then... Um, once I see, I have a couple of favorite ETFs that I really like to trade for those. Um, one of my favorites is QQQJ, which is, so QQQ is the Invesco, like top 100 non-finance NASDAQ listed companies. Um, QQQJ is the next 100. So it's um, like a little bit smaller cap um, than the top 100. And um, that's one that I really like to swing trade a lot. It's pretty easy, in my opinion, to predict some of the bottoms on it or get like close enough where if you just pick an expiration date, um, probably about three or four weeks out and usually about expect like a five to 10 percent swing. Um, that's a pretty safe trade for me. Usually I, I usually wait till it hits about 29 or 30, maybe even 31 now because it's been doing so well. Um, and then I'll usually go for an option contract about a month out and probably about anywhere from five to 10% out of the money. Um, and then I'm sure you guys have all heard of this other ETF that I'm about to say, but Soxel, uh, 3X levered semiconductor um, one. That's another one I really like to swing trade. I've had a lot of success in the past doing it. Um, and I kind of do the same thing. You know, it's pretty easy to track. You look at the three month like moving averages. Um, you can kind of predict when the bottom is going to happen within a, a couple of days or so. And then, you know, it, it hopefully swings back up. And that's kind of the pattern that we've been seeing over the last three months. Um, so those are two of the, uh, I guess, ETF options that I like, really like to swing trade. Awesome. Appreciate the transparency there. Um, yeah. One other question I had, so kind of bringing it back to the China ones, 
Um, I would love to hear maybe a little bit more in depth on Baba. You know, I'm still holding Baba, but it's a little bit concerning when you look at it. Uh, I do like to look at things with a technical analysis perspective as well. I understand that the fundamentals on Baba are great, but, you know, I'm just, for me, I, I look at the fundamentals to find a good company, but then when there's multiple good companies in a sector, um, which there are in this sector, and, you know, they each have problems and pros, but I'm just looking at it and it's it's really been struggling, you know, ever since that October um, when mm -hmm. it started going down, just having a, a ton of trouble getting to uh, back to its, uh, I guess what you would call the view up. Um, there's basically the most buying that occurred on Baba is <sighs> since that point is right around the 231, 230 ish range. And right mm -hmm. now it's at 224. So I see this little pump right here and I'd be very interested to see if it can make it back through the 230s. Um, but I guess my question for you is, at this range right now, would you be uh, a bullish on BABA? I would be bullish on BABA at this range, honestly. I think um, I think it's more of just a greater trend that we're going to see um, in the Chinese markets. They've honestly been kind of pummeled um, in the last six months or so. And for BABA, it's almost a year. Um, so I think it's not necessarily that Baba might not do anything to really like stand out. Um, I think it's more just like people are going to feel more comfortable um, putting their money back in these companies. And we're going to see um, kind of like a revival of these Asian markets as China has actually been um, the quickest economy to recover from COVID um, way faster than the U S or really anyone in Europe as well. So the fact that their markets aren't doing well is a bit of a sign to me that I think they're actually posed for like a really big um, second half of the year. Got it. Got it. Appreciate that. Yeah, there are definitely some Chinese companies such as Futu and TIGR that I'm very bullish on myself. But Terry, appreciate you uh, coming on and sharing and being so transparent. And I once again, just recommend everybody goes ahead and checks out Terry's pages and gives them a follow. Yeah, thank you. Of course. All right. Let's keep the ball rolling. So uh, I think that, you know, we've done some Twitter spaces before, uh, Greg Gavin, but I think this is your first time on a weekly Howl space. So it is nice to have you on. Some of the other speakers would just love to hear, you know, what you've been buying and selling and what's been on your mind. Yo, what's up, guys? So this week I bought back UPST at 115, which I believe will hit 200 bucks before the end of the year. So I have a big position in that. I added some more C Limited. I love the company. It's almost 5% of my portfolio right now. I added some Ford Calls, Strike 1750, expiry 23rd July. And let's see. So today I added POWW to SPOW, also known as Ammo. So someone last night shared, shared a picture of the factory. And the, the cash in the balance sheet is 7 billion, 7 million. But the factory is 200 million, and the world is they paid all cash for that. And they had a Department of Justice contract, but the numbers aren't out yet. So the factory they're building is 4x the current uh, uh, size they have right now. And if you look at the revenue growth, the revenue is pretty stagnant, right? So I believe the DOJ contract is a very major one. That's what they're building new factory. So I believe if we get the numbers, we can easily see a 30 to 40 percent pop on that stock. Another stock I'm buying this week is YMTX. They have a Padufa in September for a very major drug. So I would expect a 50 to 40 percent pop with that one day. Also, Sweet. I was, yeah. Also, I was day trading Wish, even though I don't like the company because half the stuff I've ordered, I haven't gotten it yet. But everyone on Twitter is pumping the stock. So that's what the volume is crazy. Good for momentum trading. So have you been have you been kind of like day trading wish? Yeah. Yep, I'm not holding it overnight because personally I'm not a fan of the company. I think fair value should be loan bucks based on my DCF. But people on Twitter are throwing ridiculous price targets of like 100 bucks, 200 bucks. So I just momentum trade on these idiots. So how do you how do you play it as a day trade? So usually you would see in the five day it usually peaks around no you, you, the bottom is usually on twelve thirty and you usually two, uh, two percent take profit one percent stop loss based on the volume. 
Interesting. Are you using, I guess, for day trading, are you doing kind of uh, any charting, any technical analysis, anything like that? Yeah, just use the support and resistance, right? If I see a huge, like the best way is you stood there and see what the big pumpers follow these guys and look at the tweets, right? When they tweet, Def- you just sell them because these guys bring the volume. Definitely. And then bringing it back. So you mentioned Upstart at the beginning there, right? Yeah. Cool. So Upstart, yeah, they had a they had a bit of a rough week. No, I mean, I think on Monday, right? The shares, shares were unlocked. So yeah. So they might have some selling pressure from inside the selling. But we are yet to know who sold and who doesn't. So. I mean, yeah, it is, IP it is at, definitely yeah, nice. The IP is 20 bucks, right? But we are already over 120 in another six months. So very, very interesting. Yeah, I agree that Upstart is a nice buy at 120. I'm still holding. Um, I did sell half my position at 170, uh, which well, looks I, pretty good I, in retrospect. Yeah, I, I sold everything at 160, but it went to 175 pre market the next day. So I missed the couple 15 bucks, but I bought back at 115. But my one problem is everyone is piling on the UBSD. It feels like the next fast layer on Twitter, right? So I get a bit scared if I see everyone talking about a certain company. Got it, got it. So what's on your radar for next week? So next week, I'm looking at one second. So the company is called, uh, uh, one second, where was the company? Yeah. So the company is uh, BMTX. So these guys, like when in the, if you live in the US, when you get a federal loan or a grant, this is the way it gets distributed to you guys. And these guys act like a bank and they plan to add crypto. So all of these guys, like 18 to 25, when this is crypto, they are very, very likely to use the platform and not move the money out. And in re- uh, retrospect, this is the bank. So the more money they have, the more they can lend out. So this will help them increase the bottom line. It's still a, mi- uh, mi- a micro cap uh, compared to all the other banks. But I believe this can have huge potential if they actually go through with the crypto plan they have right now. Speaking of crypto, I guess I would love to hear your thoughts on crypto this week and next week. I mean, Bitcoin is just dollar cost average because no way my dumbass can call the top or the bottom. But I believe in Bitcoin long term. But a lot of shit coins, right? So take, take the hype over right now. Yeah, I'm ready for more pain this weekend for sure. Um, cool. Awesome. I like that overview. Appreciate it. Anything else you kind of want to cover? Nope. Have a nice day, guys. Yeah, appreciate you coming on, Gergavin. Always to the point, um, if anybody's not following Gergavin already, if you like the idea that there's always a Twitter space that will be open for you to hop into, you should follow him because that's the only way for you to see them at the top of your timeline. Um, so I highly recommend doing that. He has some very, very unique and fun spaces um, that I had the pleasure of being in this week. I think everybody can relate um, that's been in them. All right, keeping the ball rolling. Also, first off, shout out to some of my uh, really awesome listeners that are in the crowd. Kayla, I think we're doing a uh, podcast later today. Hopefully, hopefully if your voice is back. And Hipster Finance and Danny Singh and my boy Josh Meltzer, who is recording, as always, uh, the Wolf Analyst. So hi, Kayla. Um, so thank you to all of you uh, for being here. Much appreciated. All right, Business Famous, I-, I kept you waiting, but you were patient and you're here. And I would love to hear the full rundown you know, what stocks, um, you know, you bought and sold. I would love to hear about your covered calls. Give us the full, the full strat. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, man. Um, thanks for having me on. Uh, you guys might know that I'm a, more of a, a boring, uh, boring long-term investor. Uh, but, uh, I do get, so get my kicks in, uh, and, and playing a little bit of options. So, um, uh, in terms of long-term investments in the last, uh, probably a theme for the last two or three weeks now has been uh, REITs. Uh, so I've been buying a lot of REIT stocks uh, just with inflation concerns and, and this and that. Um, you know, stocks that are, are based on, on real property and or, or real estate, uh, real estate backed, uh, I think are, are a good way to, to play. Um, I mean, uh, regardless, they're, they're pretty, uh, they're, they're a strong investment, right? So, um, but it's it's also a good uh, they they do pretty well in the high inflation environments or, or at least higher inflation environments. Um, so putting a lot uh, mostly into into REITs. 
Um, and then, uh, you know, like you mentioned, uh, I sell covered calls against uh, most of my holdings. Um, and I do them weekly. Uh, I feel like it keeps me kind of involved uh, in the market. I know a lot of people, when they sell calls, they do like 30 to 45 days uh, to expiration. Uh, I like to do weekly uh, just to, to keep me involved. Um, so plus it's fun. Um, and then some of the other, some of the stocks that, that I bought uh, this week is, is um, I bought some AMD. Uh, so I think AMD is, is still undervalued. And I think uh, the fair value for AMD is probably a little bit over 100 um, where it's at. Uh, I don't know what it's at right now. Um, it's at 80, 85 and change. So um, I bought some uh, AMD leaps. Uh, and then I also um, invested in, uh, uh, let's see, I'm big on uh, CCL. Uh, so Carnival Cruise, I'm still holding on to those leaps and they're, they're up pretty pretty nicely since I bought them two weeks ago. Uh, and then this week, uh, I also bought um, Rite Aid. So Rite Aid seemed to be down. I think it was, it was down pretty significantly yesterday and it's down again today. So it's uh, kind of not working out. Uh, but my the leap I bought on Rite Aid is dated uh, to next January. So uh, I think, I mean, they had a Monday yesterday. I think it was an overreaction. Uh, so, so that's why I went into uh, Rite Aid. Uh, and then uh, I added to my Palantir position. Uh, Palantir looks like it's back on on the way up. So uh, I'm big on Palantir long term. Um, more more data is is, is always better. Um, so Palantir is a, a big one for me. And then um, let's see. I sold a uh, I sold a cash secured put on uh, Blink. Uh, that's B L N K. And that's just to, that's just uh, to chase some some premiums. Uh, looks like um, premiums are, are pretty strong on there, but I also wouldn't mind holding that that one long term. I think there's some good prospects for that company. Um, and that was uh, that was the bulk of it. Uh, I think this week I, I'm always doing. Um, uh, I'm also I, I've been doing Iron Condors uh, three times a week on SPY, and and uh, the first two uh, worked out for me uh, this week. But today I had to buy myself out of. Uh, just uh, SPY went went nuts this morning, which I didn't anticipate it going over uh, 426, um, which was my my top line for it uh, for for today. But you know, so essentially, I, I kind of broke even for the week on on my iron condors. Um, that's sort of a, a weird uh, a weird option strategy where you're kind of betting on a stock staying within a certain range of prices. Um, so that's uh, like I mentioned before. You know, I kind of mess around with options to 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 get my kicks, uh, my my uh, scratch my options uh, itch with uh, with iron condors. So uh, that's sort of uh, that's sort of the recap for for me today. Oh yeah, you know what? I uh, I forgot one. Uh, I also bought into there was an IPO yesterday uh, for a company called Sprinkler, um, and that's uh, ticker CXM uh, for Customer Experience Management. So CXM. Uh, and they sort of uh, manage uh, social media marketing and social advertising. It's kind of it's it's like a platform that a lot of big companies use. So they're used by uh, just to, to name off a couple of their customers like Microsoft, uh, McDonald's, Verizon, Honda, uh, Samsung, uh, and they they kind of um, kind of use their platform to to manage their content, uh, manage their interactions with customers. Um, so it seemed like an interesting one. Um, it's a it's a SaaS company. Um, which, you know, the, the market loves SaaS. Um, but uh, I thought it was a, a, a good flyer. Uh, so I, I got a, uh, a little bit of that one. So CXM is that ticker. Appreciate the info and the transparency there. Uh, what are you eyeing for next week? Uh, for next week, it looks like, um, well, CCIV looks like it's setting up for, for a decent week. There's uh, the ticker catalyst that's coming up. Um, I think they're changing the, the ticker, I want to say, next month. I forget the exact date. But there's uh, looks like there's there's a few things uh, that are, are nice that are coming up for CCIV finally uh, after a few months of just kind of being stuck in the low 20s or even below that. Um, and I, I'm just going to keep adding to my positions. You know, I'm not... Uh, not a big crypto guy. Um, it looks like, but it looks like for, from, it looks like crypto just dips on the weekends now. Uh, so, you know, if you're into like swing trading, um, it's like the, I wouldn't say like the last, what, four or five weeks uh, is taking a heavy dip, you know, over the weekend uh, and then come back during the week. So um, I might start, start messing around with that just because I'll be bored on Saturday. Are you it's, okay? it's, yeah, 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 go for uh, it. Yeah, for CCIV, they moved the date in the new filing. 
So before it was uh, late Q2, but now it's uh, early Q3. And in some of the filing, it says 28 July, but that's just an arbitrary date. Which in the main S S4, the date for the meeting is still blank. So something I sometime saw, around September. I saw a notification today that they set a meeting for July 22nd. Today, I am not sure, but last uh, till yes, did they do, did they have a filing today? Yeah, no. I so I got something yeah from 30 minutes ago that I posted. I could tag it in here, but it said that it, the meeting was July 22nd. And oh, I was, see uh, that then because till yesterday, it was. Yeah. Let me go and find the source of that one, and I'll, I'll link it in here. Perfect. Thank you. What were you saying, Gerg? Oh, thank you. I didn't see that. It must have come out to the... Yeah, feel free to link any posts that y'all would like in here. Um, okay. Uh, business Famous, anything else you wanted to go over? Uh, no, I think that kind of caught all my moves this week. Cool. Keep, I'll keep the ball rolling because I have another speaker that's up here. And then uh, maybe we'll do a little bit of some back and forth Q&A, just some thoughts on some popular stocks. Um, and then we'll wrap things up. But Sys2 Research, uh, you're up here. Are you uh, good to speak? Let's see. I brought him up a little bit ago. You might have just been sitting. I do know that if anybody's interested, Sys2 Research does high-level research on biotech stocks that are very, very volatile often. Um, but it's, you know, an interesting uh, area of the market. And we did a podcast together, which actually – I think is live now on Spotify. So if you haven't checked it out, um, I know that I have podcasts with Business Famous. I have one with Sister Research. Maybe I'll get one going with the other guys that are up here. You can check that out on my pinned tweet. You could see um, the Wolf podcast. If you type in Wolf Financial or Market Madness on Spotify, you'll have a chance to see that. But all right. I Oh, let's see. It looks like they're reconnecting. Um, so I want to kind of keep the ball rolling with a couple of hot stocks essentially. And, and if anybody from the audience, um, I guess, has a specific stock that you want us to talk about, you can feel free to DM me. Um, we can make something like that happen. All right. It looks like Sister Research ended up just getting kind of cut out. All right. Neeks, uh, you've been requesting for a little while. Did you have something you wanted to talk about? I brought them up, but I can't hear them. All right. Sister just told me that his phone died. And that he's going to be getting back on in a minute. So uh, stick around for that. Biotech sector is really, really interesting. Um, we'll be chatting about that. But I want to bring it back to actually PLTR. So Terry, have you looked into PLTR at all? Do you have any thoughts on it? Yeah. So I actually got, I guess you could say, lucky or skilled or whatever you want to call it. I bought Palantir right at the bottom, honestly. It was right around 18, I think. Um, so I've just kind of been... Sitting on it, um, I got, I guess, literally lucky. I normally dollar cost average into those types of things. Um, yeah, 1870, that's what I got it. Um, and it's obviously, I mean, 40%, it's been doing terrific. But I don't know if I feel comfortable putting more in it at this price. Um, it's, it's a really speculative stock still, in my opinion. And it could see a lot of volatility in the next months or even potentially years. So it's, it's a company that I definitely like believe in. I believe in Peter Thiel. I think that everything he's done so far in the finance space and all of his startups have been really successful for the most part. So um, like a long-term hold, yes, no doubt. Um, would I throw like all of my portfolio into it at $27 right now? I don't know about that. So um, no, I, I do think it's a great company. Um, eventually it will start to get more government contracts, I'm sure, and we'll see it really start to have some profitable quarters, hopefully. So um, I do like that company for sure. I appreciate the insight and good for you, you know, for getting in at that low price. <laughs> yeah, that's just I, straight luck, honestly. Sometimes you, you you get a lucky one like that. Yeah, I am unfortunately sitting at just barely in the green on it right now. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I also, it's it's a small percentage of my portfolio. So not nothing too crazy. Um, all right. I see Sys2 is back. I'm adding him. All right. Can you hear us? He's up here. You got to unmute. 
Hello. There we go. Sorry about that. Hey. My phone literally died just as you were shifting onto me. So. <laughs> Well, no worries. Appreciate you coming up. Um, I was just talking about the podcast that we did, which I have set to go live today. So I'm actually going to go ahead and assume I'm checking our spot, uh, my Spotify real quick because uh, I had scheduled that to go up. And yes, the pros and cons of investing in biotech with Sys2 Research is currently live on my Spotify. It's about a 30 minute listen. So I recommend everybody check that out. But Sys2, you're up here. Um, what were you buying and selling this last couple of weeks? And, you know, what's just been on your radar and your process? Sure. Yeah, I, I haven't really been buying too much this week because I like generally like focus on catalyst events. Um, I am looking at something that is coming up and it's it's one that uh, quite a few people have been speaking about. Uh, Prevention Bio, PRVB is the ticker. They've got a Padufa coming up on July the 2nd. Um, it was just one that Stock Talks Weekly like asked me to like take a look at and look. I guess like the, the drug itself is quite interesting. So uh, the drug uh, is aimed at basically uh, people who are going to become diabetic, so type 1 diabetes. Um, what initially like seemed really great is coming up with a whole bunch of sort of worrying factors. Um, so I'll, I'll break them down just in case anyone is playing that Padufa or has the stock already. Um, so... The, the drugs are anti-CD3, antibody. Um, they, they had an adcom recently. It was a 10 to 7 in favor of the drug. Uh, the stock still dropped on the adcom because I think uh, people were sort of expecting a much better outcome, less tightly contested. Um, they now have the Padufa coming up on July the 2nd, as I mentioned before. And um, yeah, it like having taken a look at the, the adcom like document, like quite in depth and like the history of that class of drugs uh there's a couple of things that kind of stand out so uh one thing was that gsk tried to use the same mechanism like back in 2011 but the phase three trial failed um and incidentally enough uh the primary endpoint they used is one of the endpoints that prvp was supposed to be using which is just, and I don't want to go too scientific because I know a lot of people sort of like just kind of like, oh, I'm in a lecture right now. Uh, but uh, that that same uh, endpoint uh, using C peptide, which is basically a test that we use to check if someone is diabetic or not, um, that was it was initially included in their trial, but was removed later on. So it kind of like brought up some red flags in my head. Uh, because that's like a key indicator of, as to whether or not a drug, the drug works. Um, they did produce some efficacy, uh, so they managed to delay uh, type one diabetes um, occurring by about twice the amount versus placebo. So that that was good, but they had some big safety issues. So diabetic ketoacidosis popped up exclusively on the. Uh, am I pronouncing the name of it right? Tepila, tepilazumab um and on placebo we didn't have any of that so kind of like if it does get approved we'll probably get a black box uh which wouldn't be gr great for sales but also at the same time like if you're getting dka and uh it's not monitored like well enough you, you can essentially die from it so um yeah there's a lot of like i guess issues to like hone through uh with the fda uh there is something that's quite interesting, though, and it's it's something that I like paid attention to, and maybe I read into stuff a bit too much, but it worked out with Biogen. Um, you've got Janet Woodcock, who's the the lead of the FDA right now. Um, she's been pretty like pro uh, pharma, even if the drug hasn't worked. She's like under her helm, like they, they've been approved. So you had Sarepta uh, being approved for Exondis, Aducanumab with Biogen, and now you've got this drug as well, right? Um, another thing I also noticed Biden brought up uh, in his speech um, back in April where he said that he uh, was wants to put 6.5 billion towards a, a new health agency and two of the diseases he mentioned were Alzheimer's and diabetes. So like from a political standpoint, it might just be that the drug doesn't really work very well um, and will present some safety issues going forward. Um, which are probably going to be exacerbated in in the real world just because 
they had quite a small end. So like they only had like 700 odd people on the drug and you've got millions of people with diabetes. So like you can expect that 2% number to be quite large if it translates into real world. Right. So yeah, I, I'm, it's sort of one of those ones where I'm kind of like, did they just approve it because of political reasons? Um, yeah, it's one of those ones that I'm just digging into a little bit further. Cool. Cool. I appreciate that. Um, with, yeah, and, and I know that you, when we talked, you kind of exclusively, or not exclusively, but you highly play a lot of options, right? Yeah. So yeah. what option plays have you been looking at? Uh, so I, I'm actually looking at the options for this, right? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm looking at uh, potentially buying some puts uh, on on this one, um, but I'm I'm slightly wary, like because I mentioned like the political uh, side of it. <clears throat> But like when I when I go into these kind of events, like I, I size accordingly accordingly as well, um, just because like it's it's super risky like the, the way I play things. But I mean, if you get like a a sixty to kind of seventy percent hit rate, you'll lose money. Yes, like when you when you're wrong. But uh, if you're like right enough and right in a, a large enough way, you can you can make a pretty penny uh, on them. So like I'll, I'll give like Novavax as an example, which was one I played quite recently. Um, and that ran up like 400% uh, after the the drug like had a positive phase three. Very interesting. And then, you know, just to kind of, since we have the people in here, and first off, I also see Ramp Capital in the crowd. So I'm not sure if he is still in a meeting, but if you are free Ramp, we would love to have you come up and share. But um, just to, you know, we talked about some of the, pros and cons real quick maybe in like uh two minutes can you summarize for people the pros of you know why they should be looking into biotech in this sector a little bit more closely yeah so but the returns in biotech are like the 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 astronomical like when you get things right um like where you have huge amounts of risk then you always have returns that kind of follow as well right um you're looking at uh, a situation where like you could have a like a phase three readout and uh, a, a stock will pop. Like I'll, I'll give an example, which was probably like a, a massive outlier event. So Biogen had the positive uh, Alzheimer's readout or the, the approval of their drug uh, for their Padufa most recently. And the company moved like 16 billion uh, in, in one day. Uh, that was like a, a 40 to 15, 50% ish move. If I, if I remember right uh so but you you just don't get those kind of moves in any other sector especially with like a, a large cap right like it, it's just unheard of so like from the return side like when you get things right you can you can definitely make uh a pretty penny um but uh one of the other parts that i think um is a pros especially like if you've got a a background even if it's uh a background where you've like had to critically evaluate stuff like you can pick this stuff up right like i in my like previous job i've worked with like engineers they've had no background in like biomed biology or pharmacy or anything like that and they became like lead analysts at, at the firm right uh it's just it just takes some time like understanding the jargon and just being very um and say curious um but once you get your head around like all the biomarkers and stuff like that, like you, you can definitely pick it up. And I think with with the internet, it's definitely like broadened uh, the scope for people to come in and actually understand this stuff. It's just you need to take the time. Um, in terms of the cons, like one of the like, big parts again is like you get big drawdowns as well. Like if you're wrong, right? So like I'll I'll take like Orphazyme as an example. That was like a retail favorite. It became a bit of a meme. Ran up like a huge uh, like a fair amount. Um, they receive a CRL and the stock tank like fifty percent. Uh, so like the, the cons are you could lose your shirt very quickly if you just play these uh, and don't know what you're doing. Um, yeah, I think that kind of like covers like the main points. Awesome, appreciate that info, sis. Too. Um, like once again, sis two writes as well many of his thoughts on I believe Medium or Substack, actually Substack. Um, so I think that you can go ahead and check those out. I think you get three free articles a day. Uh, on yeah, so so highly... I, I've actually mm-hmm. moved moved from, from Medium now. Uh, yeah, I publish, I will publish some stuff on there and maybe like on a monthly basis or maybe not, but a majority of it will be my website. So now 
like offer cool. a premium service and um yeah most of it's on there awesome well go ahead and check that out and i see my friend hipster finance made his way up to the speaker panel how you doing hip what's going on gav how are you living the dream brother appreciate you coming up i know it's uh early by you over there west area um would you care to share with us some of what you've been buying and selling this last week and what you've been eyeing yeah man i didn't i didn't know if i'd get the tap to the big leagues but i appreciate you bringing me up um, to share some of my smart and or dumb moves. But a uh, couple things I did this week. I, I did get a full position in uh, in Credit Suisse. It's been getting hammered lately um, ever since they had that whole uh, kind of hedge blow up um, with them and Viacom. Both took a huge hit. So I don't know. I've done really well uh, with the financials over the last couple of months. And I own a couple of Credit Suisse funds. So decided to just uh, take a gamble there. It's at about 10 bucks. Um, also, uh, started moving into MTA, which is a, a royalty, a gold royalty company. Um, I really think that gold right now is still undervalued. Um, and you know, with crypto run up and stock run up over the last year, my, my gold position is really kind of just lagged. Um, I think it's at like maybe 2%, two percent, two and a half percent of my portfolio. So trying to get that up to the 5% range. Um, so bought some MTA, and then uh, just the usuals, I heard a couple of people buying QYLD. Um, I bought some of that uh, on margin, actually. So my first time buying on margin, tiptoeing into the margin space. Uh, <laughs> and as someone that does not like debt, it was, a, it was a scary move. But I can tell you, if you have M1 Finance, um, you can actually borrow against your portfolio. Um, and if you have the plus version, you borrow for a 2% interest rate. So it's a pretty low interest rate. So I'm trying to do some arbitrage there. Uh, you know, QYLD pays a, a payout about 10%. Um, the interest rate's about 2%. So I'm hoping I can swing that. We'll see. Uh, update you all later. Um, and then uh, bought a little bit of Ethereum, a little bit of Bitcoin on that dip. That was a nice dip. And uh, other than that, mostly just my, my weekly covered calls, thanks to Business Famous, and uh, start doing some iron condors with him as well. So I may or may not lose my iron condor today. I think my top uh, that it can't go past by is uh, 427. So fingers crossed for me. That was pretty much my week. Very cool. So have you been, I guess, collabing a bunch with Business Famous on this stuff? Yeah, I mean, like he mentioned, uh, I'm, a, I'm a long-term investor. Um, and, you know, I think w we all would be smart to be so. But uh, we get bored. And so he generally humors my boredom, uh, you know, taught me a lot about options trading, um, just kind of the conservative stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, we've done a couple of penny stocks together, just small stuff that really tiny portions of my portfolio that, uh, that just kind of keep you engaged. Absolutely. And then talk to me, I guess, about your crypto buys um, and just your thought pattern there. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to say, right? How do you really put a value on some of this stuff? And I think right now it's looking cheap compared to where it was a month or two ago. But at the same time, you know, it's looking expensive compared to six months ago or a year ago, right? So <laughs> hard to say for sure. But again, I, I think Bitcoin, I feel good about long term. Ethereum, I feel good about long term. So those two, I think, uh, you know, the other, the other altcoins, I, I certainly own some of just to see where it's going. Uh, you know what doge was down to like 16 cents it's back up to i think 27 now um so i've been having fun with those but 10 years from now i don't know where those will be but i do feel good about uh ethereum and bitcoin regardless of the price i think if, if you're in it long term and uh, both of those obviously you know i i kind of leverage on some platforms to earn interest um just to hold them so you know whether whether it's this month or or two years from now i'm going to be hopefully getting paid for those either way Absolutely. And I know you're a dividend guy as well, right? Yeah, I like to refer to crypto interest as crypto dividends. Um, and so earning those crypto dividends. And, and yeah, as far as dividends go, I think I crossed uh, $5,600 a year uh, in dividends this last week. So just kind of been adding to a lot of dividend positions, um, you know, every week. Um, I know I've heard from a couple of people, the market seems pretty high, but, uh, you know, some of the REITs and things like that seem like a decent value. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then I guess if there's, you know, one name that really kind of stood out to you this week in the stock market, something you were following, what would that be? 
Uh, oh boy. I don't know. You know, I, I, you guys mentioned Palantir a couple of times and that one I have, uh, sold a lot of cash secured puts and I've done some covered calls. I think, um, maybe it was trust fund. Terry mentioned he was in for 18 bucks. I think I owned it for 18 bucks and then it got called away. So I hope I'm not going to be kicking myself for that one, but similar to, to a lot of thoughts there, it's, it's hard to say where that one's going to end up. I really like the business. I think it's super interesting some murky areas of government contracting um, and clearly some good data mining technology. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know where the real value is there. Um, that said, you know, I might be sad. I was in for 18 and I, and I lost it. We'll see. Absolutely. I, I hear you as well on that. I wish that I had kind of come in for expanded my position perhaps when I saw it down at that 18, 19 area. Um, I kind of was sitting and like I said, it's been a little bit cash trapped as I'm sure Many people can relate to over the past couple of weeks, but I have another person who I think, uh, you know, Akram's Razor, who was, I think the first Twitter space that I ever went into was one of yours about three months back. So appreciate you coming up to the speaker panel. We've just been chatting about, you know, our buys and sells this week and what we've been looking at in the market. Would you care to share? I mean, I'm just losing money, so I wouldn't want to listen to me. Oh, well, I think, you know, plenty of, plenty of us can relate. So you're, you're not alone in this uh, sad boat, you know? No, nah, so it's not that bad. But, uh, I mean, I'm really not doing much. Just I'm long some Twitter, uh, some Boeing, which has been good this week. And I'm short one stock, yellow. Still going nowhere, really, for the last four weeks. I mean, I guess that's a victory in this tape, but uh, yeah. I mean, uh, I, I get the I get the trade uh, of putting risk on for the last four weeks. Right. I, I, oh, business, you got something? Uh, I just want to. No, sorry, not to <laughs> cut in. But I, I, I wanted to uh, ask a hipster a question when when uh, when Razor's done. Well, I guess I guess I have one question for you, Razor, real quick, and then we'll I'm go over the back question. That, that is, what'd you say? Um, and my question was just actually about you know being long Twitter. Um, I'm very long Twitter. I've been holding a Twitter leap that's up about 170 percent right now. Um. I've been holding that for a little while. I have common shares as well. I, you know, I, I don't see how I can spend six hours a day on a platform, sometimes more, and not believe that it's a good product. And you know, when they're just starting to, you know, they they built an audience of what was it, three hundred fifty million or something like that, you know, active users, and then now they're just starting to try and monetize. I feel like it's a great time to get in on that stock price, which is definitely going to see the bump throughout earnings. So I just love to hear. Oh, I think he's unfortunately disconnected but does anybody else uh i stock market news maybe perhaps uh, any bullishness on twitter any thoughts there yeah no, sorry it's been a little since i spoke you yeah, know i'm a, definitely a big fan on twitter i bought it in through a call option at 45 dollars, and i've just been holding that since uh i kind of really got into it with the same premise of you i, I did obviously did my due diligence looking at all the financials and a couple of their presentations but i kind of really got into it because this is where i spend all day every day. This is where I've built a platform and I've really seen the utility of Twitter. You know, it's maybe not like the biggest platform, but the people who are on it and the people who use Twitter love it and they're here to stay. And I feel like that's something we've, we've seen. It really felt like for a while, Twitter was very, very, you know, allergic to revenue. They didn't want to even, you know, invest or do anything like that. And, and this year, maybe a little bit of last year, really, they kind of really got into investing in the creator, creators on the platform. And like you said, trying to drive revenue through that. So a lot of that stuff is just coming out. I'm really excited. I signed up for the super follower beta, hoping that could come through. We'll see, we'll see. But, um, you know, I believe in Twitter and it's kind of the similar premise. Uh, you know, short term, who knows what's gonna happen with the stock. If it goes lower, it's whatever. If it breaks below my $45 cost basis, I will start adding more, maybe around 50, but 45 is, is the mark I, I do like. Uh, dollar cost averaging down. Uh, and yeah, so I, I feel like just for the long term, I'm here to stay on Twitter. The community I've seen and, and built and been a part of is super strong and doesn't feel like it's going anywhere. Yep, fully agree with that. All right, business, I'm giving it back to you for your question. 
Oh, unless you're Gavin. Did you have something real quick? Yes. So I bought two. They were in depth after the earnings around 50 bucks. But I've been selling recently because I think the MAU would be higher, but I don't think the, they would be the quarter, this one. Because most of the stuff they're doing, they can't profit off that. I mean, they have Twitter Blue, but it's trash. I tried that, but it's nothing worth it. And the next thing they're working on is the monetization for your spaces. But they let you give 97% of what you make. So Twitter gets nothing of that too. It was 97% for the first $50,000 in revenue. And then after that, it goes to an 80-20 split. So no, yeah, off yeah. the start. Off the start, but... Twitter gets nothing, right? So most of the people who start, I think in the first quarter, the next quarter for the earnings, they won't make a penny off this. Because the only can, split yeah. you have is with the Apple store, right? Because you pay with your Apple Pay. Or whatever you call them, whatever payment provider you have on file with Apple. I could definitely see that, but I think it kind of determines, like, what's baked in already for, you know, Twitter. Because, like, for the next quarter earnings, like, yeah, like, it could maybe disappoint in the short term, but I feel like it's yeah, a I move think from Twitter. Yeah, I think would be excellent, but I think they would miss the quarter this time. But, yeah, but I still think it's an investment in the long term for Twitter. And as a long term investor in Twitter, I don't really care what happens with the next quarter. I could see, you know, whatever that, that opportunity, like I said, could see it go nowhere if it does, but... Like I said, it's kind of a move in investing in the long term, investing in the creator, and I feel like the creators are what gonna what's gonna bring the value and the revenue for the long term to Twitter. So, all right, so I lost. Oh, that was really weird. Speaking of Twitter, my Twitter crashed. Glad to have you back. Just wanted to hear kind of thoughts on being long Twitter. Yeah, so a lot of people have been writing about it recently. I, I feel like on FinTwit, there's been like more, uh, you know, commentary around. Let's call it this creator driven. Economy, and I, I just caught the end of uh, what stock market news was saying. I, I mean, look, the opportunity is in the advertising business. I don't think you're going to make much money, uh, you know, charging uh, as a, you know, a paywall. Uh, basically, the Patreon model, right? I don't, I don't see that as being a, a needle mover. I see it as being a needle mover from from an engagement standpoint. I think they could do a lot of things uh, with the newsletter type of business in the sense of like crafting almost like a FinTwit fin twi- newspaper and letting me see what other people are reading and subscribing to, you You know, like the Substack problem of not really kind of having a way of understanding what's going on in certain verticals. Like, I mean, I'm a guy who's canceled most of his newsletters lately because I, not like because they're really expensive, but like I'm just not, I haven't had the time to go through them, right? So, like, through COVID, I added a lot of content that I was like, all right, this guy's interesting. This is cool. That is, you know, and then everybody's kind of started paywalling stuff incrementally. You just start realizing that, like, it's not even a question of like, is the person delivering value or do you want to support the creator? It's do you even have time in the day to go through it all, right? So you'll end up paring things down. So it would actually be interesting for me to see see Twitter be able to take what is the newsletter and like, you know, let's say I subscribe to like a Twitter monthly, like, like, like bundling, right? We've gone with this like direction of uh, infatuation with, you know, unbundling. And like now you're kind of going back to I just kind of want a paper where there's like 10 newsletters and I can slot one in and Twitter figures out how to pay them all. Right. In that dynamic. Now, as far as the business where it stands right now, I mean, engagement's important. Uh, and I mean, it's an 85 percent or so, you know, brand advertising driven business. So you would you would tend to expect the brand business to start to be picking up. I mean, there's been stuff being discussed on uh, on the iOS upgrade and the performance advertising drop off for Facebook. I think Daniel brought that up yesterday. A few other people, uh, Daniel, uh, uh, what's it called? Stock trader, not Daniel, my co-host. I'm gonna raise his edge. I see in here, but it's. Uh, I mean. It's, a, it's relatively cheap, right? Like part of the Twitter thesis is like, I mean, I like to buy growth stocks where I think they've started to inflect and go in a positive direction. You know, I was short Twitter a little over a year ago, for example. And 
like I can get my head around what's going on in the business. And yes, there's a Peter Lynch element to it, you know, particularly under COVID, right? Like a lot of people are like Twitter failed, Twitter had all these issues. And it's like, well, I mean, Twitter post COVID is a very different Twitter from pre COVID, right? And yes, there's, there's the problems that Twitter had, which they've been addressing. You're seeing that by the way, in the iteration on the product development side, but like they had to fix some really basic shit on the advertising side. And, you know, we went through that last year uh, as far as part of the conversation. But I mean, I think if you look at it, like, what's your downside? Put it that way. You know, you're going to be approaching 5 billion in revenue. Very close to it this year. You're paying like 10 times sales for it. Now, can 10 times sales turn into five times sales again and, and online? And will it probably at some point? Yes. But like relative to what you're paying for everything else and where the business is right now and like your visibility in the next 24 months into what it should be doing, uh, well, you're in a good spot risk reward wise. That's the way I look at it. Absolutely. Uh, I, I see it very similarly. And it's interesting to hear that you were shorted a year ago and kind of came around, but I completely agree that the ecosystem has uh, substantially changed and differed from what it was pre COVID. And it was kind of like the social media moved a lot with um, like trading and investing um, where you saw millions, you know, tens of millions of brokerages opened up during 2020 and then into 2021 and, you know, although many of those people already had social accounts and they already had Twitter accounts and stuff along those lines, um, people were creating more, people were using them more. Um, they were kind of coming back to it. I think a lot of people had created a social account and then had not used it for a while and then was pushed back into it. And then kind of, you know, maybe they found a community, this, this community that formed uh, with FinTwit, you know, formed, but I'm sure that many others formed as well. And that to me shows it as a better investment when you can see that there is a self-fulfilling kind of prophecy or community inside that is continuously coming back every single day creating content you know i only really knew twitter as a sports place i would say prior to 2020 um, i know that there was some type of finance community but i didn't see it as a big thing and then you know it's it's very interesting to see you know being inside of twitter talking about twitter as an investment while on its platform while they record these calls for quality assurance purposes and then you know relay them to their investor relations team um, it's just, it's just a really interesting conundrum to be a part of. Um, so that is, you know, I'm in agreement, uh, with the bullishness. Yeah. I mean, if 50 million new people started trading and like, they feel like they have to spend a little bit of time, uh, seeing what's going on with their stonks, uh, and they come to FinTwit, right. So that's, that's a change in the narrative, right? Like you have to adjust. I mean, like people forget the fact, I mean, despite the fact Snapchat gets the multiple, and the economics are better. Like Twitter's MDAUs, you know, have outgrown Snap. Now there's, we can get into the debates around like, you know, the changing metrics there a couple times, but like, this is a company that, you know, has been around for, for freaking forever. Uh, and it's, it's usage in the user base, you know, took off as it should under COVID, right? I mean, there's just no getting around that. I mean, that's what sucked me into it in, in, in June of last year, right? I mean, when I was short the stock, the stock was 40, 41. The stock had bounced around the Elliott News in February, right before COVID. And Facebook was trading, uh, I don't know, like 165, right? Like, so Facebook was growing 30%. Twitter was coming off not growing that much, you know? And... It was trading at, at, at a higher multiple than Facebook on EV to sales. Forget the EV EBITDA monster that Facebook is from a profitability standpoint. So like there was like that moment in time. I mean, yes, we should have bought Snapchat at like $10, which also had like a, a 180 turn. I mean, like that was an even bigger turnaround of a business, right? I mean, it went from losing users to adding the filters to really gaining users to you know just taking off. And like COVID again is something that stepped in there and helped out because Looking at Snap, looking at Snapchat last year, you were kind of like tough comps coming up, you know, the baby filters, you know, so yeah. I mean, like, remember when they introduced those baby filters that the running joke was, you know, I, I reopened my Snapchat account to go post on Instagram. Right. And like, now you got people who are like, I told you to never sold Snapchat, the most innovative company ever. I mean, admittedly, from a product standpoint, they're fucking fantastic. 
right? They have been leading, not following. Uh, but I mean, it had it had it had business model issues around engagement. I mean, all these things are going to run into that. Like that's going to be a question that you're going to be dealing with. And like next year, who knows how many questions are going to come up in the space because you're not going to be riding a tailwind on user onboarding, right? It's the end of COVID. You're lapping it. So I think you're safer in Twitter, although that has not like it's this market has rewarded you buying the most, you know, the highest momentum, highest beta name. Twitter still has a bunch of people who just want to be like, yeah, fuck Twitter. By the way, it's not popular with like, you know, the Ben Thompson's and the Ben's of the world, uh, the tech. uh, They always find a, a way to hate on the stock for its past for not being Facebook, really. Right. But does it have to be that much more? I mean, do we really want it to be Facebook? I feel like that's... Well, that's another question. That's a good one. Yeah. And then also with Snap, I fully agree. Um, I put out a few threads. Um, My average cost on Snap is $12.30. And I really, really like that stock when I just realized that... what it was For me, it was when they... Honestly, I mean, these have been around for a while, but it was when they really started pushing streaks. And I realized that everyone I knew that used Snapchat was going to use it every single day. They were going to come back and they were going to open that app, if not just to send, you know, a single picture to all their friends. And that was just like mind blowing. And then um, when they also put in the one year memory thing, I really saw that like become a, a big thing for me. I was like, OK, you're coming back on every single day to check your memory. You're coming back on every single day to make sure that you have your streak with your friend. And then, you know, I think for a lot of uh, my generation uh, where I am kind of right in between that Gen Z millennial area, it's so much more convenient and easier to keep a relationship with a person via Snapchat than it is via texting, um, where it seems like you have to actually have content to say to them. You have to have a real, you know, it sounds bad, but a real interest in the conversation versus a Snapchat where, you know, you can keep up with somebody by just sending a picture of, I don't know, the fucking, the window. Yeah, it's and basically it's like, yeah. message for, you know, millennials in the, in the U.S. Where like the, I mean, if you've lived abroad, the argument is like, I... I'm a WhatsApp guy, okay, because I'm outside of the United States for a decade. And when you come back here, I'm like, why are people fucking text messaging on iMessage? Right? It's like, I don't fucking get it, right? And I have friends who I add on WhatsApp, and then, like, they're back to messaging me on iMessage. And I'm like, I don't want to you, I don't want the phone. <laughs> you know, it's like, so it, the irony is Snapchat is, like, the general viewpoint, by the way, is, like, it's less entertainment and more messaging for millennials, you know, and it's like in the U S it's actually worked out that way fantastically well, you know, where they're using it over iMessage. It's like, it's taken that what's the way WhatsApp, you know, essentially kind of grew outside of America uh, as far as how it's used. They've managed to do that with the added layer, you know, of social. The stock market news, you got some in? Yeah, no, just what I was going to say to that is kind of like I find it interesting that that model, like, yeah, maybe they've taken over some of it, but like there's no revenue in like uh, or not really that I see in like doing the iMessage, the WhatsApp. I feel like WhatsApp forever has been like just a great like a lot of people use it. And I know outside the U.S. pretty much literally everyone does. But like I feel like we haven't monetized that at all. So like Snapchat really like, yeah, maybe they've been leaning into the um you know doing that and being a conversation place but what's really important and what i've been looking at with snapchat is the content side of it the other side that like maybe isn't as important or whatever or maybe not what people use it for but like for the revenue and for the company itself i feel like that's that's the part they got to focus on and you know they have been doing an okay job i know a lot of people have snapchat have snapchat shows and love them but um you know i still think they got to continue to work that out yeah, it's a good question for you, Wolf. How do you reconcile your ownership in both those names, right? Uh, I mean, when would you sell a Snapchat here? Like, at, what is it, 30 times sales? I haven't even looked recently. I, I actually have trimmed. Um, I trimmed when it did that huge run up to 70. Um, that was back in February is when I started trimming my position. And, but I, I own them because I see them as so different. It's a, to me, it's an entirely different audience. I mean, they're, they're, um, they're, they're very different, but like, it's how do you make money, right? So like Snapchat is kind of in that window where they're scaling up. But I mean, you're obviously going to grow slower 
okay, once you pass that kind of threshold of turning monetization on. I mean, that's something that, I mean, both Pinterest and Snapchat, like, yes, it's great to go from zero and take off. But remember, Twitter came public as a much more mature company. And there was that window where, where it really took off. And I mean, it it, it was saddled with a, with a nightmare valuation from the start. And that became a problem. And then they, they basically were throwing stuff at the wall to see what sticks because they had to find other ways to generate more meaningful revenue in comparison to the Goliath that they were being compared to, right? But I mean, you can argue that Twitter and Facebook are very different again as well. Like you just said, you really want to be that. But like what people want is a profitable business that compounds, you know, for forever. And eventually that's what matters in the stock market. It's all very good points. Um, I am going to pause on that for a second. I know Business Famous had a question for Hipster. And then we'll do a little bit of wrap up just because I know it's a Friday and people have some stuff to do. But Business Famous, you still have that question? Uh, yeah, well, we kind of went off on a tangent <laughs> since then. But I have a couple of things, actually. First thing, uh, we, we talked a lot about Leaps options uh, here. And I don't know how many people in the audience are familiar with Leaps. But uh, I've, I've always got, um, a, you know, maybe 5 to 10% of my portfolio in Leaps. And, and if you, you don't know what that is. Uh, you should really uh, owe it to yourself to, to kind of check them out because uh, they're a really easy way to leverage uh, your your investments into uh, into greater uh, greater gains. Uh, the other my, my question for Hipster was um, how can you hold uh, both gold and Bitcoin and uh, not get kicked out of money Twitter? Man, we waited a long time for that question. I'm glad it was a good one. <laughs> I like to pretend maybe one day I can be the bridge between the Bitcoin community and the gold community because they're both just as angry and crazy. Uh, but I think that they could both be best friends because they both want sound money. Uh, they both want to see real, uh, you know, assets. And uh, I think both present interesting arguments against, uh, you know, potential inflation. I, I personally find it strange that they don't get along. Uh, and I think if, if you're a, you know, a Bitcoin holder, which again, I am, um, and you think that inflation is coming and you don't think uh, gold makes any sense, uh, it's a strange argument, um, you know, to have for me. It's weird, right? I mean, I hear a lot about Bitcoin being referred to as digital gold, right? And then, but, but those two groups kind of have, have no, no interaction or uh, bad interaction. Yeah, I think there's hope one day that we can all we can all get along. And uh, I'll also comment on the Twitter mention, Gab. I, I was really interested in uh, in investing in Twitter just because we use it all the time. And frankly, I learn from it. I don't learn from Snapchat. I don't learn from TikTok. And I just find my brain melting when I go on there. But it makes money. And you know what I mean? Uh, that presents the argument. Like they mentioned, it's all about making money. And it's about whether or not it's a good investment, not necessarily whether we use it. Um, so ultimately, I didn't I didn't invest in Twitter. Um, I use it all the time. I think it's such a great platform. But uh, but I think it's a question whether or not they can actually become a good investment. Oh, so it's your fault. Uh, now we get it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Appreciate all of the insight into all my speakers. And as always, I just like to do a little quick wrap up. So I'm just going to do kind of a minute or two per speaker. Um, you could talk about what you're looking at next week. You can plug whatever you like. You can tell everybody what your favorite color is, um, uh, whatever, it's your time. Um, because I really, really appreciate you taking the time out of your day. You know, it's a, and it's a lot to come up, you know, and speak on these things. People have to prepare. Um, this one's a little bit more casual, but you know, I'm doing spaces all the time. So thank you to the listeners for coming into the speakers. And I would start out with the speakers, uh, sis two, what's your, uh, what's your kind of wrap up for today? And there we go. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, you caught me off guard there for a sec. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, prevention bios, a read up, uh, read out coming up. The Padufas July second. Um, right now, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Bad. If I just wrap it up in like uh, a sentence or two sentences, they've got uh, bad safety data, um, questionable efficacy, uh, but politics rules and this kind of stuff. We saw that with Biogen, so that might be the reason why it gets approved. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Gergavin. I have nothing. Everyone go follow Wolf, download his app Wolf Financial, and have a nice weekend. Big hearts, big hearts. Wish there was a heart emoji. Um, always hearts for Gergavin. Thank you, sir. 
Uh, if you're not already on the Wolf Financial app and you haven't checked it out, link is in my bio. It is free to download. And I think all of my speakers, uh, I don't know about uh, Akram, but I think all the others have uh, downloaded it or on it, have posted. So really fun stuff. So please do I check not, that out. Uh, Wolf Financial, I'm, I'm happy to do a whole conversation on that. Um, no, in another okay, no, moment, that's but, probably the wrong question to ask right now. <laughs> but right, yeah, yeah. Long, long story short, kind of like a thin twit upgraded. Um, but we have a lot of stuff coming over the next few months that's going to really uh, differentiate us. But okay, I'll, I'll, so you've, I'll, you've got you've got a natural acquisition partner. It, there we go. Exactly. That's that's why I do what I do. Uh, but Akram, yeah, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, thank you for coming on and speaking. First of all, um, it's been a, it's been a while since we've been on a space together, so I appreciate you chatting, and we'd love to hear if you have any wrap up for today. Um, no, not really. Well, I then I will, questions. I'll wrap up and say everybody I thought, go. I thought I was come in here and find out what's going on with uh, the Portfolio Hawk, uh, what is it, uh, survey, but I didn't get any updates on that. I haven't seen his survey either. What's the Gavin... Portfolio and Jester? <laughs> that one? Yes. So Who it won? ended like seventeen thousand vote for portfolio and three vote for Jester. Oh, so who voted for Jester? You? Nah. <laughs> I mean, I was the campaign manager for portfolio. Oh, well, there I you go. I was the sponsor for the election, so I, I, I like to take take uh, the the win uh, for for that. I like to take responsibility for it. Cool, cool. Uh, I. I... I like to see all these elections going on in case. Oh, if anybody hasn't voted yet for John W. Rich kid for mayor of Gary, Indiana, uh, that is another important election that is going on currently. So I highly recommend checking out um, at John W. Rich kid and voting for him for mayor of Gary, Indiana. All right. Uh, hipster. Hey, no big wrap up for me. Uh, obviously find me uh, here on Twitter, uh, Instagram as well. DMs always open. I got a tiny YouTube, so feel free to find me on there. Um, and uh, as Business Famous mentioned, always talking uh, gold and Bitcoin and, and other things that don't play well together. Absolutely. Business Famous. No, not much. Uh, it's just everyone, you know, stay invested and, and keep dollar cost average against it. Companies you believe in and uh, everything will work out fine in the end. Hell yeah. Stock market news. Yeah, two stocks I'm watching for next week. AMD and Baba, two names that were said here. Uh, if you guys want to see my buys and sells each week, just check out the, my pin tweet. Let's take you to that. And yeah. Sweet. Awesome, man. Um, once more, feel free to, you know, everybody go ahead and check out the speakers. Uh, if you're into spaces, if you like listening to spaces, these are all classic space speakers. You really cannot go wrong. And this was also recorded by my wolf analyst, Josh Meltzer. So I'll try to have this recording up shortly in case there was something that you wish you could have heard um that is all for today have a fantastic rest of your friday i hope i i hope and i pray that this market turns around a little bit and we get some green going into the close take care y'all